Let's talk about what's going on in the ACC Coastal. Obviously, we hit on the Atlantic just a couple of days ago. We are going to dive into uh, this bunch that, I mean, won the ACC last year. This division was crowned a champion. But the Pittsburgh Panthers is who we will begin with, and they were, uh, what's the best word for this bunch? Um, They were interesting last year. They Their stats were basically a top 10 team all year, which makes that loss to Western Michigan, who ended up a 7-5 and five team, all that much more perplexing, right? This was a strange situation. They went 11-3 and three last year. Post-game win expectancy said that they were about 10.38 and 2.62, which, yeah, makes sense. And that's, uh, that's regular season, so obviously. Uh, I am, mm, I'm interested. In this, uh, this team PPA margin number six last year, net points per drive they were number fourteen, uh, total plays per game was number eleven. So this was a an up tempo offense that really got after it. Number twenty two in turnover margin, so they did a good job of taking the ball away from the other team and also not turning it over themselves. There are a lot of changes here, a lot of changes. Obviously, you lose Kenny Pickett, you lose Jordan Addison, you lose Cam Bright, uh, Lucas Kroll, the tight end. Uh, Let's move on to the offense. Let's talk about the offense first. New offensive coordinator, Frank Signetti Jr., he was the OC at Boston College. He replaces Mark Whipple. At Boston College, they were running very pro-style kind of stuff, not exactly what Whipple was doing. You're bringing back only 56% of the offense. Maybe that's good if you're going to be bringing in a new a new guy to run this thing. Um, they won the ACC for the first time ever behind a sixth-year senior quarterback picket a Blitnikoff winning wide receiver, a high-flying offense. Like, what What do you do next? You go pro style. Like, this move kind of doesn't make a ton of sense, but if you were ever going to do it, now would be the time when you've moved away from your quarterback and your stud wide receiver, etc. Looking at it, uh, the entire offensive line and tight end starters, etc. are back. Uh, skill players are all new. The quarterback Slovis joins. Running back room has plenty of experience. It, in wide receivers, you got Pretty good transfers, I would say. Uh, you're bringing in uh, Kanata Mumfield from Akron. You know, you, you've you got some guys that you can do some damage with. There is talent on this roster. Uh, by the way, overall returning production, number 63. You got 63% coming back, 56% on offense, 70% on defense. Defense is bringing back the number 35 most in the country. And when you look at uh, roster strength, and this is via our buddy's uh, CFB winning edge, Pittsburgh number 23 in roster strength. Number 12 on defense, number 43 on offense. So basically, you're going to be leaning on the defense more so than you did last season. Uh, The defense, even with as much as they were on the field last year, were incredibly efficient. I mean, just ridiculous. Uh, Looking at the defense on that side, this was a nard dog masterpiece. Last year, they kept the defense efficient while having to defend the number 110 most plays in the country. That means that there were only 20 teams in the country last year that were on the field more than the Pittsburgh defense, and yet they were number 12 in PPA per drive. I mean, that is just remarkable from that defense, and they're bringing back 70% of it. Uh, The defense returns multiple starters at every level, ton of juniors and seniors all over the two deep, Uh, 2023 could be iffy, but 2022 is still going to be good for this defense. And I think that this team is going to be great on defense whenever you've got uh, Pat Narduzzi, right? I think it's going to be great. Defensive line, one of the best in the country. Linebackers look strong. Secondary's got questions. They were number 64 in pass success rate allowed last year, but they were number 21 in pass plays PPA. So people were able to have success on them. They just couldn't score on them. And that's where it became you know, they became even more efficient in that regard. They are projected favorites in nine games. You got seven games that are toss-ups, and those toss-ups means the point spread is somewhere between, you know, zero and eight points on on either side. Like, it's a one-score game, effectively, is what the spread is. Uh, The keys to the season here. How is Keaton Slovis going to mesh with Signetti? Like, wide receiver Mumfield could be a star here. If they don't get too conservative... Um, which is something that we've seen Narduzzi do. But Mumfield with Slovis, I mean, that has the makings of something pretty interesting. I'll always trust Narduzzi's defense with his defensive line. 
my expectations are way up there. I'm still hung up on the offense. Like I, the move just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Other than we know that Whipple and Narduzzi didn't always see eye to eye. And I think that can be a good thing sometimes. But obviously in this situation, Narduzzi wanted to go back with somebody that, you know, he felt was more aligned with him uh, on the offensive side philosophically, right? Um, another key to the season, aggressive teams will typically end up with more penalties, but they were number 91 in penalties per game last year. You got to clean it up. Uh, the schedule sets up pretty nice as well if you look at it. Uh, the win total this year, by the way, is eight and a half. It juiced to the over a little bit. To win the conference, they are eight to one. Uh, to win this division, they are 2.75 to one. So plus 275 here. Uh, you know, you start with West Virginia and then you got Tennessee. Both of those are at home. You play at Western Michigan, who is not going to be nearly as good this season as they were last year. You got Rhode Island before you enter into conference play. And then you start off with two home games against Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech. Now, what sucks about that is the back six games, four of them are on the road. At Louisville, at North Carolina, Syracuse, Virginia, uh, Duke, at Miami. Oh, and the Virginia game's on the road as well. When you look at these other rosters, there's not a lot that really terrifies me. I've got Pitt going eight and four here. But, I mean, it wouldn't shock me to see him get to nine. It wouldn't shock me to see him only win seven, right? I mean, this is just kind of up in the air, this whole division is like this basically every year. I am curious about it. I will certainly say that. Uh, I've got a loss to Tennessee, loss at Louisville, loss at North Carolina, and a loss at Miami. Yes, a lot of those are on the road. I could see them winning some of the road games, maybe giving up a home game to Virginia Tech or Syracuse or whoever, right? You could even lose that first game to or to uh, West Virginia. So there's no telling. But, uh, but I like them at 8-4. and four. I think that sounds about right with this team. I am so interested in what this offense is going to look like. I mean, that's the biggest thing for me is you go from having one of the most efficient offenses in the country last year, you lose your quarterback, you lose your star wide receiver, but you bring back a lot of everything else, the, the bones that made that thing run. Can you recreate it but make it a little more conservative, which is what they're going to try and do with Signetti? I mean, we'll see. We will see. Next on the docket here, the Miami Hurricanes. And last year was interesting, obviously, because, I mean, they finished second in the Coastal, but they got a new guy coming in. We'll turn it over on the screen here. Miami went 7-5 and five last year. And, of course, now you move to Mario Cristobal, uh, the way that that coaching change went down just left a bad taste in my mouth. And obviously, I don't have anything against Miami. It was just, it was so businessy and so, like, leaving Diaz out to dry, right? I, I just, I hated that. Absolutely hated it. But uh, but regardless, you know, it is what it is. We are now at this situation. Number 21 in returning production this year. They went 75 last year. Uh, post-game win expectancy was Almost the exact same. 6.98 wins for them when it came to the stats. Uh, their projected SP Plus record is 9-3 and three this year. They are bringing back 81% of their defense. The offense is losing quite a bit. They're bringing back 69% on that. Uh, but roster strength, number 9 in the country. Like This is still an incredibly talented unit, uh, and the offense is more talented than the defense when it comes down to it. When you, be, when you factor in recruiting rankings and experience, etc., it all goes in there. Let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about the offense first. Offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis, of course, comes over from Michigan. He burned a couple of bridges on his way out of Ann Arbor. I think we can say that safely. But I'm not sure that we've actually seen what his offense looks like, and I don't know that we will see it this time, right? I don't think Mario Cristobal is just going to give him the offense. Like, Cristobal, I mean, it's going around on Twitter today. He had Justin Herbert and only let him pass on 47% of available snaps. I mean, it's just kind of a waste when you've got a, a quarterback talent like that, but you want to play it so close to the vest so that you don't get beat. Is, is Cristobal going to want to continue to play scared and play conservative and don't beat yourself? In doing that, you can end up beating yourself. Like, <laughs> that's, that's what gets a little crazy. If you've got the talent to be able to do it in the quarterback, which he certainly does with Tyler Van Dyke, Maybe you got to open it up a little bit. We'll see if that's what Josh Gaddis wants to do, if that's his thing, 
or if they continue to play a little bit conservative. Uh, Gaddis, of course, was under Harbaugh at Michigan, and we know what Harbaugh liked to do. He'd run the ball, very pro-style, very conservative kind of stuff. Uh, the quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke, he's, he's turned into a superstar since entering in last year after Derek King hurt his shoulder. Um, I don't know how he's going to gel with Gaddis. Uh, plenty of talent on offense, especially two new skill transfers. Uh, they got guys coming back from injuries. Offensive line looks strong. They weren't great in 2021 for sure. Uh, the rushing success rate last year was number 102. I mean, just not able to get it done as far as that goes. Passing success rate, number 56. I think it would have been higher had Van Dyke been playing the entire season. But regardless, uh, they were number 16 in explosive play rate on offense, and that is pretty good. P.P. Amper drives number 60. Eh, it could be better. I would expect it to be better this season. Moving on to the defense, Kevin Steele takes over as the new defense coordinator. He had a knack for creating top 20 units at Auburn under Malzahn up until that last season where Malzahn ended up, and they lost a bunch of guys. Uh, heading into that season. So they were having to rebuild it. But Malzahn, of course, le not left, but was relieved of his duties. And then, of course, there was all the mess that went on where the Auburn brass was trying to get Kevin Steele the job. Would not surprise me if he gets brought up again when they end up getting rid of uh, Brian Harson. But we'll, I, I digress. Defense brings back 81% production. As I mentioned, uh, safety Bolden is gone. The linebacker McLeod, defensive end Johnson uh, are not going to be there. Uh, still lots of toys for Steele to make work this year because they've got, I mean, it's a bunch of talent there. You got Miami talent. Secondary was number 24 in pass success rate last year, that, but they were number 65 in passing PPA. Uh, the defensive line was bad against the run, uh, at least rushing success rate. But, you know, and they, they were number 20 in stuff rate, so there's promise. Like, they were able to get back there. Maybe they just couldn't tackle. So we... <laughs> There's, there's things to work with here. Some of these numbers did not make sense when I started looking over it. It was just very interesting. Uh, they're projected favorites in 10 games. They got six toss-ups. Again, that is games that are expected to be decided by one score. Let's look at the keys to the season. Yeah, you got your your key players here, the left tackle Zion Nelson, defensive tackle Leonard Taylor. Uh, I mean, you got a bunch of dudes. You got a bunch of dudes that can really, really make a difference here. Paris Jr., the running back from Ole Miss. You got uh, another transfer in, Knighton. Tight end, Will Mallory. Like There's there's a lot here. Frank Ladson comes in from Clemson. Like This is, this is going to be interesting, for sure. This collection of talent. Their last three losses last season were by two, three, and three points. Like Should they have been a 10-win team? Yeah, well, four of their wins were by four points or less, too. So this team was basically a question mark all year long. How quickly can Cristobal reorganize this mismanaged program? Uh, he's he's at least got experience doing that, for sure. He's done it everywhere he's been, other than when he was the offensive line coach at Alabama. Uh, basically, this program has not been able to get out of its own way, but it's also been incredibly underfunded as far as the football program is concerned. Uh, defense was number 115 in takeaways per game, and they still won seven games last year. But you you got to be better than that this year. That's one of the keys to the season. Uh, win total is an eight and a half. Uh, juice the same on both sides. You know, to win the conference, they're plus 550. I I like them to go 9-3. and three. I've got a loss to North Carolina, loss at Texas A&M, and a loss to Florida State. But that's, that includes a win at Clemson and a win over Pitt. So maybe you get the win over Florida State and you lose to Clemson. Or you get a win over North Carolina and you lose to uh, Pitt or whoever, right? There's, there's certainly losses that you could see on this schedule. But there's also, you know, there's also things that, I mean, you could you could maybe make an argument for this team going like 11-1, and one, right? I doubt it. I don't think that first year that they're going to come in and just light the world on fire. I think they're going to be a good team that is showing improvement over that 7-5 and five from last year. But remember, that 7-5 and five included like seven games that were coin flips. So... Eh, let's maybe pump the brakes just a, a touch on this. I don't think that they're ACC championship yet, but I do trust Cristobal to be able to recruit. I trust him to be able to coach this team. Remember, this guy won Pac-12 titles with Oregon, and and that's after going 7-5 and five with Willie Taggart's bunch. So it's not like he took over an Oregon program that was, uh, that was awesome. He just built them up. He recruited well. He's going to do the same thing at Miami. We will move on and... We are going to hit on the Virginia Tech Hokies. 
Now, Virginia Tech, of course, got rid of Justin Fuente. Totally understand it. Things were not going well there. They moved to Brent Pry, of course, the defensive coordinator from Penn State. Went 6-7 and seven last year. The postgame win expectancy said they should have been closer to a 7-5 and five team as opposed to a 6-6 six and six team during the regular season. They got walloped in the bowl game, but uh, I don't know that there was a lot to play for there. So, regardless, uh, we'll start off with the offense here. And, oh, by the way, number 65 in returning production, roster strength is number 60. This is maybe the worst roster I have seen Virginia Tech have in a long, long time. I mean, they are going to have to get really creative when it comes to this roster, both on offense and defense. Uh, but we'll talk about that here in a second. The, the numbers were just putrid last year. But, um, but yes, this offense, by the way, the offensive numbers, uh, roster strength number 86 on offense, number 18 on defense. So the defense can maybe keep you in some ball games. Uh, they're number 23 in returning production on defense, number 106 on offense. And both of them were not good last year. Defensive PPA per drive was number 86. Offensive PPA per drive was number 90. A net points per drive was number 80. They just, this team was not great. And yet they were still relatively fundamentally sound. Number 53 in turnover margin, number 43 in penalties per game. Uh, let's start off with this offense. Like I said, Tyler Bowen, who was the Jaguars tight end coach, uh, is the new offense coordinator. He was the co-OC at Penn State in 2020. And of course, that's where Brent Pry came from. Uh, he's a former tight end and offensive line coach as well. So he, he likes to to get teams to play down in the dirt. That's what he wants his offense to do, is to run over people. And I think that that's they're going to have to reshape this offensive roster to be able to get there, because I don't think they got the pieces to do it yet. Quarterback Braxton Burmeister was not able to get it done last year, number 111 in passing success rate. They did bring in Grant Wells, who was the quarterback at Marshall. Now, can he curb his turnover problems at Marshall? Because he, he threw a lot of them. I mean, just a bunch. Uh, Pride did hire Joe Rudolph, who is the associate head coach and the offensive line coach and the running game coordinator at Wisconsin for the last seven years. Wide receiver skill personnel doesn't seem to fit what they want to do as far as blocking downfield, etc. The offensive line does not appear to be up to snuff, and it's going to take some time for them to get where they want to be on offense. They, they are going in a different direction than the majority of college football is right now, and that could certainly work. It could definitely work, but this is going back to a bygone era that I'm curious how it's going to fit, right? With the hires that he made with Bowen and Rudolph, yeah, well, I want to see it. I just want to see it. All right, uh, from there, let's talk about the defense, okay? Brent Pry's defense is at Penn State, finished top 25 in yards per play all eight seasons that he was a defensive coordinator there. He did pretty good things when he was with James Franklin at Vanderbilt as well. Linebackers Dax Holyfield and Tisdale are back after combining for 16 and a half tackles for loss. That is going to be pretty important. Defensive line could be an issue here. There's not much experience depth. It doesn't fit the scheme that they're wanting to run as far as being aggressive. Uh, secondary should be pretty good. They were number 23 in passing success rate allowed, uh, and that's even after losing Jermaine Waller. I still think they've got a lot of talent back there. Uh, obviously, secondary should be the strongest unit on the defense. Uh, they're projected favorites in seven games, and I would assume most of that is based on the talent that is going to be on defense. I don't know that I think that this is a seven-win team. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, their win total is six and a half. To go over that six and a half for them to get two seven wins is plus 130. So it is significantly juiced to go under six and a half. Looking at the keys to the season, it's going to take a long time to fix this. Um, the hires on offense look like they're set up to shorten games, use tight ends, et cetera, because they don't expect to be able to get a ton of skill talent. I would assume that's why he's going that direction. Or it could just be, let's zig when everybody else zags. Maybe that could be it. It looks like the VT admins are playing the long game here. I think they're going to give Pry plenty of time to clean up the roster. I assume that they feel like they kept Justin Fuente maybe a year too long, maybe two years too long. And they're going to give Pry enough time to build his way back out of this, right? Because they they know that the hole was dug pretty deep down. So they're going to have to get him in. The back half of the schedule is set up for immense success, if you look at it. Uh, defensive strength is a nightmare matchup for Virginia's offensive scheme. You look at after that bye week, you know, you, you've got, before the bye week, you get West Virginia at North Carolina, at Pitt, and then Miami. 
And then you take a bye week. You've got at NC State. But then once you move on from there, Georgia Tech at Duke at Liberty and Virginia. You could reasonably win all of those. I've got them actually starting off two and six on the season and winning the last four games to get them to six and six. Now, obviously, that's not going to go over the win total, but I, I think if you get to a bowl game in year one with this roster and the way that you're wanting to play, I I mean, that's a commendable job. So I, I like the hire of Brent Pry. I like what they're doing here. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for them to fully build this thing up, but obviously, we'll get there when we get there. So uh, let's go and hit some more ads, and we'll hit the last four on the back end. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini, or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show, looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now... Back to the show. Next up is the Virginia Cavaliers. And last year was a very, very interesting season. Um, They did go through a coaching change. Bronco Hall decided he did not want to make changes on his staff. And in doing so, uh, he just decided he was going to retire. He's been doing this long enough. He's made enough money. He doesn't really give a rip anymore. So Robert Anai, his offensive coordinator, has headed off to... Syracuse to be their offensive coordinator, who we talked about on the previous show. But the new head coach is former Clemson offensive coordinator Tony Elliott. And it's strange that this hire happened right after Elliott was the offensive coordinator on one of the worst Clemson offenses we've seen in a very, very long time. Was that his fault? Was it the Clemson system? Was this just him getting out of dodge before things go really south at Clemson? Who knows, right? If you're going to take a a Power 5 head coaching job, you might want to go ahead and grab that thing, right? I think that Virginia is a pretty good landing spot for him because obviously you're walking in, you've already got your quarterback figured out. You look at this team and the way that they were built last year, the defense was just putrid. Uh, But when you look at total plays per game, this is another one of those defenses, which surprised me the most about Pitt, by the way. This is a defense that was on the field a lot. This team ran the number 17 most plays per game in the country. This is nuts. I mean, they they were number 117 in PPA per drive on defense, but number five on offense. So you you won't find a bigger difference than these guys last year. This defense was just putrid. We'll, uh, We'll start off, remember the biggest losses here, they lost their entire offensive line. They lost the tight end, Jelani Woods. Um, the defensive end, uh, Mandy Alonzo, I mean, et cetera. They they lost they well they lost some dudes. I mean, big time, and and a lot of them to transfer, et cetera. The the new offensive coordinator is Des Kitchings. He was the Falcons running back coach, a former NC State co offensive coordinator. I uh, I don't I don't know a lot about him. I'm not gonna lie. I, I don't know a ton about what he did when he was at NC State. Um, but who knows? I mean, I, I trust Tony Elliott, I think. I think. Brendan Armstrong is the key here. He's got plenty of receiving threats. He's got Wicks. He's got the tight end Mish back. Uh, he doesn't have a single starting offensive lineman back, as I mentioned. Uh, look, Anai, the, the former offensive coordinator, threw the ball 62% of the time that or last year. Do they continue that philosophy, or do they balance it up a little more so that they can help the defense out? That's what I'm curious about when it comes to this offense this year. So, uh... I do, now that we're going to talk about this defense, I think they made an absolutely phenomenal hire on defense. John Radzinski, he spent the last four years as the Air Force defensive coordinator. Air Force number four in total defense in 2021. So this was a monster hire for them. 
Uh, defense was a disaster in 2021 for Virginia. They lost linebacker Taylor. Defensive end Alonso hurts. Uh, if you change philosophies on offense, maybe that's going to help you out a little bit more, keep your defense off the field more. Uh, they were number seven in offensive plays per game, number 98 in defensive plays defended per game. That's just, I mean, just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Uh, Radzinski's defense, number 16 in yards per run uh, allowed last year. That's 3.43 yards allowed. Virginia was number 123 in that metric. Uh, the linebacker, Nick Jackson, should help, uh, along with the transfer defensive end, Cam Butler. I'm I'm so curious about this because I don't know that the personnel that he's got right now is what Radzinski wants to work with, but he has been a whiz at figuring out how to stop the run with whatever he's got. That's what he did at Air Force for all those years. Like, I think he's been there in D.C. since 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Um I'm I'm interested. I'm interested for sure. Keys to the season, by the way, they're projected favorites in seven games, which I find a little bit surprising, uh, especially with all that they lost. They're number 80 in returning production in the country, Number uh, 58% coming back. That's number 96 on defense, number 75 on offense. As far as defense goes, you're only bringing about 55% returning production. Maybe that's a good thing. Like, if you've already got a bad defense, why would you bring back the same guys and expect them to get better? I don't know. But, uh, keys to the season. Can a defensive shift to focus on stopping the run improve the defense, even if the talent is lacking? Uh, the transfers should help on the defensive line. At least you would hope they would. Curious if the completely rebuilt offensive line will be able to block for the quarterback Armstrong. If so, he's got a ton of weapons they'll be able to work with. Other Clemson offensive coordinators that are taking head coaching jobs have not fared so well. Chad Morris, Jeff Scott. What is Tony Elliott's team going to look like? Is this going to be just a rebrand of Clemson? of the same system, or is he going to do some stuff outside of the box? That's what I want to know. The win total is 7.5, and, and it's juiced heavily to the under, and I'm going to side with that. I think this is a 6-6 six and six football team. I don't... I mean, you look at the schedule, yeah, there's, there's some wins here that they should be able to get, especially early. Even still, I, with all the change going on here, I think it's going to take some time for them to really get into it. They got some layups, though. I mean, you got at Duke, you got Old Dominion, you got Richmond, you got uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, you got Coastal Carolina coming in, which I think could be very interesting. You play at Virginia. Uh, there's, I think there's plenty of losses on here. Uh, and I'm looking at the way that I'd set this up, and I've got win-loss, 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 win-loss. I've got them 6-6. Six and six. <laughs> Basically, never winning two in a row, never winning or never losing two in a row either. Um I, I don't think this is a team that's going to win the conference. I don't think they're going to win the division. I do think Brennan Armstrong is going to put up some crazy numbers. But I think this is another one of those where the coaching change and the philosophical changes are going to maybe give them some losses that you wouldn't expect and wins that you wouldn't expect. And I, I think you should expect that for most ACC teams. So, uh, so I've got them 6-6. Six and six. I like Virginia. I just... I don't like them that much this season. I think moving forward, maybe things can be really good. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, Brendan Armstrong is going to be a lot of fun. I just don't know that it necessarily equates to a bunch of wins. I'll say that. All right. That moves us on. We've got three more that we want to hit. I've already gone to an hour, so we're going long again. It is what it is. The North Carolina Tar Heels. And I have to write my time down. Excuse me. da 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 the North Carolina Tar Heels, of course, led by one Mac Brown. He's been here for, I believe this is his fourth season now. Things did not go well last year. Six and seven, lost the bowl game to South Carolina. Uh, defense was bad. Offense was okay, except for in the games where they really needed them. Post-game win expectancy was 5.81 and 6.19. So they went six and six in the regular season, and that's exactly what the numbers said they should have been. When you look at turnover margin, Number 86, that is definitely not good. It's going to get you beat more often times than not. Uh, penalties per game was okay, number 57, whatever. Their PPA margin was number 68, and that includes PPA per drive on offense of number 29 and on defense of number 96. So this defense was putrid. Uh, returning production, number 68 in the country. They're bringing back 62% on offense. It's only 48%. On defense, 76%. Roster strength, the offense looks like it is not in great shape, but the defense is number 10 when you include, of course, recruiting rankings and experience, etc. So roster strength, of course, brought to you by the guys at CFB Winning Edge. 
So you can go check them out, join their Patreon, etc. The offense coordinator, Phil Longo. Still doing his thing. The offense was kind of rolling last year. Number 11 in rushing success rate. Number 17 in explosivity rate. We've watched Sam Howell for three years. Now he's off to the NFL. Obviously, things did not go as well last season. Everybody kind of thought that he was going to be a first-round quarterback, and he did not pan out to be like that. But I wonder if that was more so him or if that was the fact that the offensive line was number 69 in havoc rate allowed and number 84 in stuff rate allowed. Uh, that that stuff just doesn't, those numbers do not mesh with the fact that they were number one in rushing PPA per play last year. That just, it, it does not mesh. So the offensive line could run block, but they couldn't pass block? I, okay, you got me. Um, what I want to know is what do you get out of the quarterback this year? You knew kind of what you had with Sam Howell, uh, so long as he was protected, for sure. But what do you get out of the quarterback, Drake May? What do you get out of uh, Jacoby Criswell, whoever ends up being the starter here? Wide receiver Josh Downs is an absolute stud. Uh, there's more playmakers, but the, the offensive line of quarterback, you got to hit. You got to hit those spots. Moving on to the defense. Defense declined last year. Obviously, you look at how bad they were. I mean, it's pff, not great. So, Jay Bateman, of course, was let go, and Mac Brown does what he always does, and he brings in somebody that he has worked with in the past, somebody that was out of football. Uh, Gene Chizik moves in, former Auburn head coach and former North Carolina defense coordinator. So, uh, what a decline for them. They went from yards per play defense in 2019 to number 50, 2020 to number 74, 2021 to number 105. I mean, just a steady decline, getting worse and worse. And the crazy thing is they've got talent. They've got dudes. They recruited well, and yet they could not get it done. And I don't know if that's because of the offensive uh, ideas or or what. Um, 15 of 19 players with 200-plus snaps returned, so that is certainly good, especially when it comes to returning production, etc. cetera. Chizik has a pedigree, but he has not been part of a top 40 defense since he was at Texas under Mac Brown back in 2006. They've got an incredibly talented defensive line. you got to get them to stop the run. They were number 115 in rushing success rate allowed last year. Just putrid. Uh, projected favorites in eight games. Um, you know, okay, their win total is 7.5, juiced to the under at minus 140. You know, I, I think this is an incredibly talented team. The offense could take a little bit of time to figure out, but I think you could line up Phil Longo with the high school team, and he'd be able to put up points. So I think that the offense will be fine. Keys to the season. Even with an experienced quarterback in 2021, the turnover margin was number 86. I think part of that might have been the offensive line. Uh, the offense was explosive and efficient, except against teams with a pass rush, as you saw against Georgia Tech last year. Just putrid. Uh, Chizik has got to figure out this defensive line. Uh, they're too talented to be number 107 in stuff rate, uh, number 107 in havoc rate. I mean, just putrid. Let let Rucker and Silver, et cetera, loose. Just let them go do their thing. Uh, don't make this defense too complicated. I think that might have been the big thing. You you got to figure out the defense. That, that's the key to the season is defense. Uh, they've recruited well. They gave up an average of 9.42% more points per game than their opponents were averaging. Like, that's when you're giving up almost 10% more points than your opponents are actually averaging for the season, that's bad. I, I mean, it's... I don't even know what to say. I've I've got them. I've got seven and five on here, uh, but I also have just looking at the schedule. I've got them at eight and four. I've got losses to Notre Dame, Pitt, at Virginia, at Wake Forest. I've got a win over NC State, a win at Miami, a win over Virginia Tech, and then I've got them winning all three of the games to start off the season: Florida A and M, at App State, and at Georgia State. Uh, which, by the way, you are a P five program. What are you doing having games at Appalachian State and at Georgia State in the same seat? That This just does not make sense. I mean, what are you doing? Regardless, uh, I do think that they are more talented than these teams. I think they should be able to get those wins. Uh, the changeover to Gene Chizik could work out beautifully, or it could be a disaster. Um, I don't think it could be a whole lot worse than what it was last year. I will say that much. So, So we'll have to pay attention to this. We'll have to see exactly what ends up happening, but I do have them at eight and four, and and I feel pretty good about it because I think that they've recruited well. I think they've done a good job. I don't know. 
I like North Carolina. I, I just think they're too talented to continue to do the same crap that they've been doing. So, with that said, we will move on. And we're moving to the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. And yes, this is this is going to be rough. So if you are a Yellow Jackets fan, I apologize to you right now. But this looks like this schedule <laughs> was set up by somebody that wanted Jeff Collins to get fired. Why you would do this, I mean, I have no idea. I, I, I can't make sense of this at all. We'll get to the schedule. We'll get to the... I'm, I'm still... Every time I look at this, I, I get more and more perplexed because, my God. I mean, you open up with Clemson, and obviously that's a little bit of an ACC thing, but you, you go Western Carolina, that's good. Get a little bit of confidence. But then you play Ole Miss and at UCF. I mean... And then your first... Uh, or I guess your second conference game is against the, <laughs> the defending ACC champs. So... Um, they are number 123 in returning production. That's number 103 on offense and number 119 on defense. 44% coming back on defense, 48% coming back overall. Post-game win expectancy last year was 3.54 and 8.46, so it was right around what they ended up, which was 3-9. and nine. Their projected SP Plus record is 3-9 and nine again. The roster strength is not great. Now looking at the offense, like Jeff Sims showed signs in 2020, but he was pretty subpar last year. Collins did bring in transfers, Gibson and Fomashan. I hope I said that right, uh, the backup quarterback from Clemson to compete for the job. So what they're doing as far as their quarterback room goes is, I guess, getting more guys uh, to compete for the job. Uh, Gibson comes in. He was the quarterback at Akron. This is such a perplexing football team. There's talent there, like especially with some of the transfers. Uh, can they develop enough chemistry to compete on offense? They were number 100 in PPA per drive last year. There's no specialty. There's no one thing that they do really well. They were number 89 in rushing success rate. Uh, they were number 91 in passing success rate. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's it, this is such a weird, such a weird thing. Um, here's what to know about the defense. Andrew Thacker's third year as defense coordinator. They did well against the run, uh, number 33 in rushing PPA. But when you look at their rushing success rate allowed, it's number 93. Um, they were terrible against the pass, number 29 or 129 in PPA per pass. It meshes with what they did on passing success rate, which is number 127. They tried to be aggressive last year. It did work at certain points. If you watch them against North Carolina, for sure. But on the whole... Like, it, this was not good. Number 66 in total scoring opportunities, and and they gave up number 104 points against. I mean, that's just, oh, it's putrid. Defensive line, woefully inexperienced. There is talent there. Linebacker looks good with Thomas and Ely, uh, but not much else is there. The defensive backs are at. They brought in five transfers, so you're looking for anything that's going to stick here. Um, they're projected favorites in two games. They got four games that are toss-ups, and that's... If you're a projected favorite in two games and you only have four games that are toss-ups, that means that eight games you are expected to be close to a double-digit underdog, if not, I would say if not more so, but that would mean triple digits, and I don't think we're going to get to that point. So They've only got five returning players that took more than 400 snaps for the Jackets last year. They had a bunch of transfers. Obviously, Jameer Gibbs uh, transferred out. Like That's not good. Uh, Quez Jackson's gone. Jordan Dominic's gone. Like, uh, it's not a good time for a lot of new faces. This is kind of a make-or-break year for for Jeff Collins. 17 transfers, 15 recruits in. Um, there's too much wrong here to come up with just a few keys to the season. Uh, unless all these transfers gel and you end up with a Michigan State situation like you did last year with Mel Tucker, this is going to get ugly because they've got a really, really difficult schedule. Um, I don't know what the record is for Collins to keep his job. That's that's the weird thing. It, is it five wins? Is it still not making a bowl game? Because if you get to five wins against this schedule when you've got this roster, I mean, you're almost a miracle worker at that point. Like, four of the first five games are brutal. Four of the fa uh, last five are on the road. And again, I, I talked about it earlier. Like, their win total is three and a half. I, 
I think that I like the under. I've got them at two and ten here. I mean, uh, you start off and four of your first five are Clemson, Ole Miss, at Central Florida, at Pitt, and then on the back end, your four of your last five are at Florida State, at Virginia Tech. Then you play Miami at home. You got at North Carolina and at Georgia. I mean, where are you supposed to get your wins? Uh, Western Carolina and Duke are the wins that I've got on the schedule. Like, I I don't know that you can beat Virginia because I don't know that you match up talent-wise. I just, I wonder. I wonder about this. This does not look like things are going to go well for Jeff Collins at all. Maybe you figure out who the next guy is going to be uh, because I just, I don't see things working out here. Like, this is, it, things have not gone to plan for for one Jeff Collins, for sure. All right, we'll close off. We won't spend long on this one. I spent longer on Georgia Tech than I anticipated. I apologize for that. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, we will talk about the Duke Blue Devils and whew, Mike Elko. Uh, I mean, voluntarily walking in to take over this gig. This bunch went 3-9 and nine last year under David Cutcliffe. Of course, Cutcliffe is now like an assistant to the commissioner uh, on football side or whatever for the SEC. <laughs> so uh, he... he Got talked to by Texas about coming in uh, to maybe help run their offense a little bit. Uh, maybe not as a coordinator, but as an analyst, whatever. He ends up with uh, the business side of the SEC. So their postgame win expectancy last year was supposed to be more of a four-win team as a three-win team. But regardless, their PPA margin was putrid. They were not great on offense, but they were even worse on defense last year. Uh, number 120 overall PPA margin. That's number 83 PPA per drive on offense, number 126 PPA per drive on defense, which means that there were only four teams in the entire country that were worse than them on a per-drive basis last year. Whew. Uh, returning production is number 115, which makes sense. I mean, you've got a coaching change, uh, especially coming off of a bad season, etc. This is the worst roster in the ACC, and it is not even close. I mean, not even close. Um I mean, at least the schedule. Like, they, they set up the schedule to where you could get a few wins here. I mean, my gosh. Just uh, just ridiculous. Uh, you start off with Temple at Northwestern, North Carolina A&T. And then you play at Kansas. So, like, there's there's winnable games right off the bat. So, not not too shabby here. Let's talk about the offense, though. New OC Kevin Johns is from Memphis. Uh, did a pretty good job with the Tigers. Quarterbacks Riley Leonard and Jordan Moore are going to battle for the starting quarterback job because... Their quarterback, uh, Gunnar Holmberg, along with leading receiver Jake Bobo and the starting running back, Mateo Durant, are all gone. Uh, they are returning four offensive line starters, so that is certainly a good foundation to build on when you got the middle of your offense built. Uh, there are playmakers. Uh, you got Jalen Calhoun to work with, the wide receiver, but the roster, again, still a long ways off from being competitive in the ACC. The defense, uh, new D.C. is Rob Smith. He was Rutgers defensive coordinator. Of course, Mike Oko knows what he's doing. You've seen what he's done with Texas A&M. You saw what he did with Notre Dame before that. You saw what he did with Wake Forest before that. And I think that those Wake Forest ties are why he went to Duke. He understands how to win at a small private school in the Carolinas. Bottom line. Bottom line. So I, I think this is a good hire. I'm just curious why Elko took it. Yeah, either way, I think he was up for some other jobs, but... I mean, he is getting on up there in years, and he had not gotten the offer that he really wanted yet. So uh, we shall see. Regardless, uh, part of the reason Elko was hired was to fix this defense. Again, number 126 PPA per drive, number 108 success rate allowed overall, uh, number 126 in scoring opportunities allowed, and points per scoring opportunity allowed. I, that is crazy. They were number 126 as far as the amount of drives or the amount of uh, the percentage of drives that teams were able to get inside of your 40-yard line. Like, they could not stop anybody last year. Uh, they got solid pass rushers. That's good. Uh, defensive end, R.J. Oban. You got the defensive tackle, Carter. You got the linebacker, Hayward. But that's it. That's what you got. There's a lot of inexperience here. So maybe it's good that Elko can, like, mold these guys from the ground up. Maybe. They're projected favorites in two games. Uh, they got five toss-ups, which is actually more than what Georgia Tech had. Um, they are projected to be a double-digit underdog in nine games per SP+. So the expectations here are ground floor. Like, this is 
I'm not going to say year zero, but it's about as close to that as you can possibly get. Elko begins a long rebuilding process. If you see any sign of competitiveness, count that as a successful season. I will say that. I've got them at 2-10. and 10. I've got a win over Temple and a win over North Carolina A&T, but that does include losses at Northwestern and at Kansas. I, I think that those two programs are a little bit higher than what Duke is right now. Um, I'm really curious. Like, what is Kevin Johns going to do with this offense? What is the defense going to be able to do in year one with Elko and Rob Smith? This is a building year. The win total is three. I've got them with two wins. I mean, we'll see. Uh, their division odds are not great. <laughs> I mean, it's 150 to one to win the conference. It's 500 to one. Uh, that ain't gonna happen. That is that is not gonna happen this year for sure. All right, we went a little long again, and I appreciate you guys for hanging out with me. <laughs> so, if you watch this long, uh, tweet me something interesting. Uh, tweet like with a hashtag Gary goes too long or Gary went too long again or something along those lines. So uh, let, let me know if you've been paying attention for sure. All right. With that said, we are going to get out of here. Thanks for listening to the winning cures, everything podcast. The website is winning cures, everything.com. And if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at Gary WCE at Chris B G and any at winning cures, or you can email us Gary at winning cures, everything.com or Chris at winning cures, everything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.